Welcome to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. Here's your host, the Bitcoin Boomer himself, Gary Leland. Hello, I'm Gary Leland, and this is the Bitcoin Boomer Show. Now, just to make it clear, where this is called the Bitcoin Boomer Show because I'm a boomer. And we talk about Bitcoin, not because this show is just for boomers. Anyone is going to enjoy the information we have on here. But I'm the Bitcoin Boomer. That's why it's the Bitcoin Boomer Show. And we come to you every week to try to educate you on Bitcoin. That's all we want to do here is educate you on Bitcoin. I try to bring on great guests that can explain different parts of Bitcoin, different services that are in the Bitcoin field or Bitcoin area, you could say. And I have a great producer here, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie produces my show every week. And I like to get a little, a little question or two here from the peanut gallery. She's my only peanut gallery here. I have one, one my, my, my producer. <laughs> Steph, you pull all the information to, for the interviews and get together with Joe, in this case, before the mm -hmm. show starts. Was there anything about when you, you discovered that you uh, thought was interesting or want me to ask or anything. Try to get my input from her. Yeah, so his ex-profile references a web page for his own personal site, and there was a plane on there. It looked like his plane. It might not be. So I'm just curious about the plane. Um, and it's kind of cool to have another unchained person come on because I know we've had um, a small handful. So it's always good to have him back and learn more. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and you're right. I didn't even see the plane until you told me about the plane, and I looked, and yeah, we're definitely going to find out about the plane. And you're correct. It's, I think we've had almost all the crew, all the early crew from Unchained on, except maybe uh, Violet uh, or Velvet. I always get her name confused. I should be embarrassed, but she knows I'm going to screw up. So sorry about that. <laughs> So, but it is great to have uh, Joe on the show and another Unchained person. Um, do remember to share this show with your friends. We want to get as many people educated about Bitcoin as we can get educated about Bitcoin. I'll say this probably again before the show's over, but I truly believe Bitcoin is going to be world changing if it hasn't already changed the world. And I believe it's going to be something that everybody eventually is going to own and want to know more about. So do yourself a favor, do a friend a favor, so you can start getting ahead on learning. I'm not telling you to buy, I'm just telling you to learn. Learn about Bitcoin and share this show with your friends so they can learn about Bitcoin. And we'll be right back with Joe Kelly from Unchained right after this word from our sponsor. So do stay tuned, see you in a minute. And welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. We've got an exciting show today. As I said earlier, we have Joe Kelly from Unchained, a great guy. We have some things in common in art and other things. So let's, instead of wasting any time, let's bring Joe on the show right away. Joe, welcome to the show. I appreciate your time. Um, how are you doing today? I'm great. It's an awesome day. And uh, you're down in Austin, for those who don't know you. And yep. And before we get going, how about real quickly, just give us a, a short bio of who is Joe Kelly, just so people can know a little bit about you. So I was born in Anchorage, Alaska. My parents have been up there for a couple of decades before having me. And uh, after unfortunately losing my mom to cancer when I was a teenager, my dad, sister, and I took off sailing, lived on a boat for a couple of years. Um, that led me to want to be an entrepreneur. I got to Austin about 15 years ago, started my first startup with uh, Drew Ponsel, who's also my co-founder here. We sold that business in 2013 and then got really into Bitcoin and wanted to start our next company in it. So that, that started Unchained. So you were, I, I like Drew a lot. I love Drew. He was actually one of the first Bitcoiners I met, you know, back in really? 2017. Yeah, I'd been in Bitcoin about a month, uh, went to Austin. They used to have the Texas Bitcoin conference there. Yes. H had more crypto than they did bitcoin at that conference um but uh, i met drew i was just walking around and i met drew and he started telling me and I, I i didn't know jack about bitcoin i was trying to learn bitcoin as well i came and he was i always felt he was so nice taking so much time with a pleb you know that you know he was like not going to get out of here you don't know anything you know he was like trying to explain what you guys did i didn't know y'all were partners in another business before you did unchained so, yeah that's right you know, that, that business was in data analytics. It led to both of us dropping out of, uh, of UT at the time, uh, but we, we were in different programs. 
And yeah, it was, it was a four year journey with that with that company. It was kind of during that era of of big data as a bunch of new technologies were coming online, things that were were technically still or you know novel distributed systems or keeping data consistent across a bunch of different machines in a cloud computing setting. So it's actually a nice primer for Druve and myself somewhat, but especially Druve. I mean, it's funny that Druve was kind of, I, I, I like to call him my Sherpa uh, up the Bitcoin mountain. So interesting that he maybe played a similar role for you. And so, yeah, we just, we got along very well, worked together well at that, uh, that company, we became good friends. Um, so we're close personally and professionally. And uh, yeah, it been part of just that, that experience, the opportunity to work again together and Drew's appreciation again, coming out of looking at what are the hard problems in distributed systems and how does Bitcoin solve that in a, in a novel uh, and unique way? Um, really, I primed us well to kind of understand it and, and work on it. Well, you know, you guys have a good relationship, obviously, but and, and are both good guys. But, you know, mostly everybody I've met at Unchained I feel like it's a pretty good guy. I mean, I really do. I have so many friends, I feel like, that either work at Unchained or have worked at Unchained. People, I mean, I think the, the that's, you know, sometimes you might say well, the founders help set the culture or things like that. So maybe we uh, we have some influence on that. And uh, I'm, I'm just kind of a people first entrepreneur and leader. Um, Drew might, might be uh, maybe a product first person, although don't, don't take anything away from his empathy and um hard for people too. So yeah, m- some of my mindset's kind of a, um, if, if even if the business doesn't work out, as long as the people were uh, taken care of, or you know, had the opportunity to grow in their careers, then that that was a success. So even if like the, the financial outcome of Unchained isn't awesome, you know, I think there's, there's ways we can make a dent, make our own debt in the universe. Uh, thanks to Bitcoin in our market and the people that are here. Uh, but yeah, it's something like that orienting principle of how uh, our people are treated, how um, their you know their impact here is is felt and like recognized. That that does build a, a good, healthy culture. I think, and you know, like attracts like. Well, you know, and just to like be um, clear with everybody and upfront with anyone around, I am an Unchained customer. I have been for quite a while. I have vaults. I have IRAs. Um, I'm a big uh, believer in what you do, and I've been very happy with that. So I do want to make sure that people know that in all clarity. How did how did you guys decide to go from what you were doing in your last business to like picking Bitcoin? Um, you know, because that's kind of a, a different uh, move, I would think. How, how did that come to being? If there's a, uh, if, yeah. that mem- if your memory serves you on that, because I know it's been a while now. No, I, uh, I, yeah, for sure. And I mean, there, there there were a couple things going on in that that decision. One was you know, we had a, a joke, but it's it's pretty you know it's serious still. I, I, we had, for our first time in our lives after that acquisition, money we could afford to lose, or some money we could spend on Bitcoin, or kind of take a flyer on this. Um, what seemed at time a speculative asset, maybe a new technology, maybe something that um, could grow or have an investment case behind it. But we were, um, you know, still, I think part of that, I think there's ways you can watch almost the eras of Bitcoin and, and uh, a generalization you can make based on almost the demographic or the, the type of population that, that gets in in parts of these cycles. And you know, pre-2013 and 2012, that was a very, you know, cyberpunk era uh, or cyberpunk and, and you know, more... Uh, deeper technology, deeper security engineer type people and cryptographers were, were getting into Bitcoin. But by 2013, that's when I'd, I'd say more of kind of a Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur kind of cohort came came through to it. And that um, I, I was definitely you know, part of that wave of Druve. Um, and the later waves, I think you can you can see in like 2017, 2020 was a very Wall Street, um, you know, cavalry kind of uh, arrival into, into the space. So each hype cycle, I think, brings in its own demographic. So Druve and I are part of that 2013 era. Um, tech bro and demographic perhaps. And I'd say when it came to the decision to start Unchained, we were looking for you know, the, the things that we could leverage from our first business that we thought made help make us successful. One of one thing in which, for instance, was uh, picking a good market, picking a growing market. Having started a, the almost the best decision we made at that business was starting a big data company in 2009. Uh, so just as big data and cloud computing and Amazon Web Services, uh, all, all that stuff was just kind of coming out. And that was um, then became a feast for large enterprise uh, businesses that needed solutions, needed to acquire companies, needed to find uh, ways to manage their own data better. 
So that was uh, that was something we learned. So okay, we, we, if we want, want to do something that has legs and can can succeed as a business, let's make sure we plant a flag or find find a, a wave that is sufficiently large and, um, and we can see into the future doing well. Uh, other things that we didn't want to repeat, you know, one, one of the things we did uh, in that business was early on, we we the plan was to be a data marketplace, be something like a content library for lots of different data sets. Um, and we we didn't have a good customer for that. We didn't know who our customer was. We, just, we thought it was like that was a cool thing. That was a thing that should exist. Let's go find customers for it. Uh, and and that was really hard. Uh, we ended up having to pivot the business after some layoffs and you know, took some extra investment that dilution. And that uh, that pivot you know, did end up being successful, but it was a pivot towards uh, enterprise customers. Or no, no. You know, instead of trying to kind of boil the ocean or have this this catalog, we were trying to kind of shop to anyone that would take it. Um, we then kind of defined our, our segment as more like Fortune 100 companies that that need database solutions. Um, and then, so when it came to starting Unchained, you know, we wanted to be in Bitcoin. We're seeing this as a trend, and we were kind of in that 2016 era. You're kind of looking at the future. This is just pre ICO. It's just very much when like um, a lot of that narrative of, well, I don't know about Bitcoin, but yeah, certainly blockchain is is the thing. You know, block, blockchain technology. I'm a big believer, in it, but I don't know if I believe in Bitcoin. That that was a that was a frequent narrative or a frequent way to kind of sound smart or like considered at the time um, if you're an investor or in, in certain circles. And so um, I think I don't want to say I, I was 100 percent like all Bitcoin. I was I was at the time like curious or observant of, of Ethereum or these other things. And we even on chain supported for uh, a little over a year, Ethereum as a, as the loan collateral. It was by, by customer demand. That was something we thought people would want. And so we get into the lessons we learned by dropping that later. But um, when it came to and taking the lessons from that first business into Unchained, one of the key insights was just knowing who our customer was from day one. I didn't want to have to go through a painful pivot like we did in the prior business. Um, I would just have rather known like who we're we serving from day one and then just try our darnest to serve them as best we could. And so my insight or the thing was just like the Bitcoin holders are the customers um, that everyone else trying to take a Silicon Valley playbook or try to, you know, take this this platform, you know, idea or like this blockchain for real estate, blockchain for dentists, well, you know, all these things like that was um, that was a misguided kind of classic solution in search of a problem or technology in search of a customer. So um, for us to really put our foot down and say like, no, I mean, the insight, like the, the kind of secret at the start of our business was that we just were going to focus on big one holders as the customers. And then, you know, that will guide what technology we build, that will guide what kinds of products and services we offer them. That's how we, uh, we approach this business, you know, after learning from the first. Well, that's pretty good information. We're going to tell you, Joe, we're going to take a break right now for a commercial. We'll be right back and continue with that and some more stuff. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. I'm your host, Gary Leland. And before we bring Joe back, I do want to ask you to please think about sharing this show with a friend. If you know anyone you think would benefit from this information, please share this with them. You're doing them a favor. Well, welcome back, Joe. Let's get back to the show here. So, so you guys were, were into doing your own business. You, you picked Bitcoin as your second thing and went into that. But, but how did you find out about Bitcoin? I mean, because I think you said 2013, good time. Yeah. Fine. I, I didn't find out about it till 2017. So you'd been into it four years by the time I found out about it. And luckily, I found out during a dip, you know, <laughs> that people were all panicking about it. I didn't even know it. Um, so how, how did you find out about Bitcoin? It really, I mean, I would say kind of through Drew or just some of the, the tech circles I was in around that time. And you know, Drew had heard of it earlier, I think quite, you know, a couple of years earlier and just um, kind of made a mental note of it, thought it was interesting. And, uh, but the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, neither of us could afford you know, either time or attention outside of that, that startup to Bitcoin or you know, even money to, to throw out something like that. So, um, it was in 2013 that, that both of those constraints relaxed and we could buy some, which of course, once you buy some, um, you're now more incentivized to learn something. And, um, you know, both, both he and I are very curious, you know, aspiring or if not re real uh, multidisciplinary individuals. And so I, I just, I found it so satisfying to learn more about Bitcoin because at every step, there's something uh, usually concrete in the way it works, or there's something that it illuminates about, you know, the, the rest of our world, either how finance works or how global markets work, or um, even how uh, cycles of 
belief and you know, adoption of, of currencies or, or technologies work. So that's just a really rich domain. Uh, and you can spend a lot of time learning in it. And that was part of what also motivated, I'd say, um, the commitment to Bitcoin and, and, and Unchained for our next venture was that, okay, I think this, you know, my, my mind could feast on this for a, a decade or more. I, I could like uh, learn a lot working in this, in this area. So that, that's kept me here. And then, um, so you're going from there to, like I said, what I think is a great company or I wouldn't do business with you, you know, in really a short amount of time, if you really think about it, it's been 11 years. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I just, I don't want to go on and on and on about it, but I can't say enough about uh, Unchained being a great place to do business with. Um, let me ask you a question, another question before I go on about Unchained anymore, though, and get this out of the way that I ask everybody. What mm. is Bitcoin? According to Joe Kelly, what is Bitcoin? I get so many different answers to this, and it's amazing how many different things Bitcoin is to different people. Um, so according to Joe Kelly, what is Bitcoin? Uh, I know, what a great question, and very rich. And then, yeah, it touches on, I think, just uh, how I'd answer some of that last question to the degree it's that I think it's I've, I've been playing with this phrase a hyper modern like object it's like the kind of thing that can't couldn't exist ex except without so much work that's gone into cryptography and computer science and um, it is kind of a, a latest in like an evolution of those those kinds of things and yet it's uh, it's also something as uh, new and novel and frontier opening as uh, you know I think people compare the internet but I've I really bought into now Drew, you know, early on for Unchained. He wrote a blog post comparing the invention of Bitcoin or the, the discovery of it, maybe arguably, but the um, you know, re release of Bitcoin in, into society as, as something like the release of the telegram, you know, over, over 100, maybe almost 150, 200 years ago. That that was um, that was really, if you squint, you see the the, the beginning of the, the telegram and the ability to send messages with each other near instantaneously anywhere in the world. Well, that was just kind of the, the opening that then like the last chapter was, you know, the, the internet, the internet was kind of the final, like penultimate, like version of that, that kind of a thing that's happening. Um, and then what Bitcoin is, is it's really this kind of dawn of a, um, a, a way of transacting value with each other nearest again, near instantaneously, but in a way that's digital and, you know, scarce and has all the, the, the great monetary properties, uh, much more than gold. Um, and is a kind of more truly digitally native currency. So it's almost, you know, his, his idea is not to compare it as, um, you know, so, so little of a, of a thing as the, the dawning of the internet, but it's something as uh, huge and long ranging in its effects as um, the dawning of the, the telegram and that kind of instantaneous communication. So that's, that's my, answer, my answer for today. That's a good answer. I have not had that answer so far. So like I said, I get different answers all the time. I think my most common answer, if I had a common answer, would be freedom. You know, people oh. people throw out that one word, and then I have to get them to go into it a little bit more. But um, hey, y'all, um, something else I saw that I, I hate to say it, I'm not that familiar with, I have heard of it, is that you're on the board of the Texas Bitcoin Foundation. Um, yeah. Could you tell us about that real quick? Happily, yeah. So I don't know if you met Natalie Smolensky. Yes. Uh, she's probably largely in the Dallas area, so it'll be a great guest sometime. But um, so she started this foundation. She's the executive director. It was a couple of years ago. Invited me and a couple of the board members. That includes uh, Tur Demister, um, Ovik Roy, and Dan Hughes. Um, so it's a couple of us that are uh, you know on the board of this, and the, the mission is really. Uh, education and basically it, it, it's uh, like, but not lobbying. So not, not like a political action, like political lobbying kind of uh, force, but something that lives more at the um, the education and kind of research level. Uh, and then it does uh, it, it's behind, as you see on this, this page, the Satoshi papers. So it's really one of his first um, kind of major efforts. And so over the last year or two, I mean, Natalie gets, you know, really all the credit here, but she's helped organize a, a book that's something like a real real volume an ac of, a, of academic papers uh, done by kind of working academics. And that's something that's based on Natalie's background, uh, working with and in academia and you know, like seeking to kind of bring some of that that rigor. You know, not all uh, academic institutions or, you know, I think there, there's a lot of good that comes out of them, even for all the ways we might um, uh, complain or, or, or critique them these days. But at least the, the idea of, uh, of, of Satoshi papers, something like the Federalist Papers before a kind of hyper-Bitcoinized, looking at like the, the social systems 
um, the, the political economy of uh, of our modern world, but you know, after Bitcoin and the Bitcoin exists. And so it's got some great um, people that have contributed to it. Uh, it's, it's near final. It's in kind of final rounds of editing and should publish in the next few months. Uh, so yeah, it's been been a fun journey. Uh, I mean, after that, you know, we'll be doing a lot of our focus will be on events and promotion of, of the Satoshi papers. And then you know, we hope to kind of raise more money and, and work on more educational efforts. Well, I need to be more familiar with that. Probably need to try to get involved or help that out sometime. I like Natalie. She's she's a great person. Uh, I probably need to contact her, actually, to speak at BitBlock Boom uh, this year because I've never had her speak there. Um, so yeah. um, I made myself a note while you were talking to contact her. So and speaking about BitBlock Boom, I do want to announce that Unchained is our platinum sponsor again this year for our eighth year, and we're excited to have you back. Like I said, I like having you there because – I do business, and I like to have people represented there that I know that um, that I at least feel comfortable with recommending them to it. Um, you know, real quick, do y'all have um, have you watched that show that for, on HBO about Satoshi Nakamoto? No, the one that identifies Peter Todd. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I had someone yesterday tell me on the phone, uh, my wife's friend was wanting to find out about Bitcoin. She goes, I find it fascinating who this Satoshi Nakamoto is and that they figured out who it was. <laughs> and I started laughing. And do, do, let me ask you, do you think Peter Todd is Satoshi Nakamoto? It, which we, he'd been 14, I guess, at the time. And not saying a 14-year-old couldn't figure it out. But um, what do you no, think? I mean, I think he's a brilliant man. I think he's capable. And um, I, I did, I, I spent a little time with him actually at a, at a conference uh, just recently, but that, uh, and I, I will credit him too with being a very good sport about people teasing or, uh, um, you know, joking with him as, um, as if you're Satoshi. Uh, and yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's high praise, right. For somebody to be able to, to, to be at that kind of tier of um, engineer th- thinker uh, kind of a thing. So um, kudos to him, but, I really don't think he's Satoshi. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. I, I don't, I, not that I know who is and probably ever will. Um, I feel at this point that we're never going to know who Satoshi is. But uh, I found it really weird that he picked that out of there because uh, everybody I've talked to that has met him or has known him doesn't think that he is. Hey, we're going to uh, take another break and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Please stay tuned. And like I said, tell your friends about this show. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. I do want to make sure you know that the purpose of this show is just to educate you about Bitcoin. I truly believe Bitcoin is world changing. I think it's already changing the world. And I think it's something that eventually everybody is going to have to know about. So I want to share this information so you can start learning about it now. I don't have any Bitcoin to sell you. You're not going to get a a hit from me like on the silver to buy silver or anything. I'm not going to say buy Bitcoin from me. That's not my goal. My goal is to bring on great guests like we have today with Joe and to educate you about Bitcoin. Now, welcome back to the show, Joe. I want to go into Unchained a little bit real quick now um, because you have quite a few services you offer and quite a few of them that I use or have used in the past. Um, you know, you have vaults, multi-sig vaults. Um, and I guess that's the, the I, I would guess that's the strongest part or the biggest part of the business. I, I don't know what's what over there, but that's the part that, uh, most people I know are, are using is the multi-sig. Could you explain what Multi-sig is, first of all, for people, because a lot of people won't know what multi-sig is, and that's really a great way to ensure you don't lose your Bitcoin um, to someone hacking into your computer. So I'll just let you go with that right now. Yeah, certainly. So, um, I mean, really, everything we do at Unchained is organized under the the mission or the idea, the North Star, that we are here to serve the financial services needs of of the long-term Bitcoin holder. 
Uh, and some that what you know, a very important thing if you're holding Bitcoin for the long term is to hold it safely. And within the Bitcoin protocol, there's there's very very limited functionality, some, you know, somewhat intentionally. Uh, but some of that lim- limited functionality uh, outside of transacting Bitcoin with one another does include um, simple ways you can lock up Bitcoin in what's called a multi-sig address. And so multi-sig address, you can you can imagine it as if it's like a treasure chest for your Bitcoin. Um, I mean, any address you know on the blockchain is going to have you know if it's if it's, a, if it's a live address, there's some kind of balance uh, maybe associated with it. But um, so this this lockbox or this treasure chest of of your Bitcoin that's multi-sig. There's there's ways you can spell multi-sig where the it's all n of m. Uh, so like one of two, one of one, two of three. Uh, basically, where that latter number is the total number of keys associated with that box or address, and then the former number is uh, the number that are necessary to open it. So two of three multi-sig says there's three keys associated with this address, and two of the keys are required to sign in order to spend. So you can't just have one of those keys sign. Um, you know, the Bitcoin network's not going to honor that transaction. There has to be two signatures that show up uh, in order for that box to be opened and that Bitcoin to move. So Unchained, much of our um, our, our entire you know, platform, our business, our products are all baked, have this functionality baked in. Uh, and there's sort of unique ways or things we've learned in the journey about how to do that. Uh, but that's, that's essentially what, what multi-sig is. Yeah, with, um, you know, I have my wallet set up and... I don't, I, I'm not really sure how efficient this is or how well this works, but I have it set up this way, where if I want to transfer out Bitcoin out of my wallet using two of my wallets, I can. It's limited as to how much I can transfer out at a time. Um, so I guess basically someone couldn't make me transfer all of my Bitcoin holdings at one time, since I can only transfer I think five percent at a time. Um, is that pretty much, uh, I don't know if efficient is the word, but uh, a pretty strong piece of protection from that, that that's $5 one, wrench attack? Yeah, I think that that's one way you can kind of uh, perhaps set some limits that you know, don't you know, have you kind of you know, under duress or near scenario, you know, sweeping all of the, the funds at once. Um, so yeah, adding some of that, that kind of constraints to the type of transaction that can spend Bitcoin from that address. That, that that's definitely one one mitigant. Uh, there's things like time locks and other features that the you unchained know, isn't quite that baked in today. Uh, it's not always you know absolutely necessary, but there are, there are ways our, our vaults are, are going to get more features like that that will help you configure. Yeah, a time lock would basically say, oh, this coin can't move. It's unspendable until two years from now. Or you know, so there's some rule set that might say. Um, you know, that, that just kind of create a, a different constraint on the, the spendability of the Bitcoin. And you know, any kind of constraint you put on there has to be measured against like the risks, the risk of loss, risk of something going wrong, risk that in your case, you really do need to spend half your coin. But again, if you if you never, you really can conceive of needing to do that, you know, maybe 5% threshold is, is great. Oh. Um, you know, you also have like on there though, and this is one that I've u- used that I messed up. You have where... You can set it so that you have to do a video yeah. of yourself reading a script, if I remember correctly, saying, hi, this is Gary Leland. I would like to transfer this Bitcoin or whatever the message says. And I did. I had to sweep some one time and I had my camera covered actually with an unchained little slide thing over the camera. And uh, uh, Violet told me, he goes, uh, or Velvet, it's Velvet. I always get her name confused and she knows it. So I'm not embarrassed. Um, said, yeah, we got a message from you, but there was no picture. And I was going, wow, I was wondering why that didn't work. So people actually do look at those and do them on a one-by-one basis when someone does that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's been a feature that's been in place for a couple of years, and uh, it's, it's definitely more, more interesting territory these days with the, the advent of AI and deep fakes. Uh, so it's becoming more, more popular. But yeah, the, and the idea is, you know, in this multi-sig arrangement, um, to also kind of clarify... Um, some of how that's implemented within with Unchained. So we have on the order of eight thousand clients, r- roughly hundred thousand Bitcoin we help secure, and uh, most of that Bitcoin is held by client vaults where they're holding two of the three keys. And so when they're moving Bitcoin uh, in, in from those vaults or to a different vault or transferring, all of it's always on-chain transactions. It's not like a Coinbase or other. Uh, exchange you might use that really present a very brokerage-like interface, something you might be used to at a Fidelity or Schwab. Uh, but that's that's kind of how 
you know, a lot of more kind of retail focused exchanges work um, and, and people's expectations, you know, around like being able to move Bitcoin from one wallet or other, that all that's happening inside of a ledger at those places. It's not it's rarely, uh, if at all, except for when you're transferring out on an exchange that an on-chain transaction uh, occurs. So with Unchained, all, pretty much all these transactions are on-chain. And when you're moving the Bitcoin, if if you as one of those vault holders uh, don't have both of those keys handy, maybe you lost one, or maybe one's just uh, you know in a further away location, you keep it at your your lake house, not your um, your condo where you live or something. So uh, that's that's a situation which you can request Unchained to sign. So you sign with one of your keys, and then you put in a request through an application for Unchained to sign with its key. And uh, inside of that process, that's where there's this this video verification feature available to pre-record. You have to record yourself. Um, you, usually, the clients will have at the beginning of their account created a initial video, like a video that establishes their likeness and who they are, and has some kind of just you know in in our system and in our system records uh, with that kind of a thing. But then uh, later, when when it comes to transaction time and they're actually requesting a signature from Unchained. They submit a video at that time. As you said, you're reading a script. I would like to transfer 0.5 Bitcoin to the following address, starting with blah. And yeah, it's an interesting um, feature. You know, and, and we do we do have uh, people that, that look at those, and that that's still kind of an important gate or important factor um, to not automate something like that or just trust machines to to deduce if this look really is the person um, because you're going to see more um, you know fake videos or things like that. They're able to be falsified by artificial intelligence tools, things like that. Um, so we, we just, we take great care uh, when when and if we're, we're using our key to, to know that it's like the actual account holder, that's a valid request. Uh, if we're unsure about anything about the transaction situation or the, or the uh, video, then, you know, we're out reaching out to the client, looking to get, get uh, in touch with them, have a live conversation or something, especially, you know, live video calls are very hard to fake. And you know, we're still good about uh, as people, you know, being able to, you know, See, see one another across the scene and know, and know who, who it is we're talking to, know if it's somebody we've built a relationship with. Okay, it, yeah, and like I said, it's really nice. I mean, you kind of get to know people if you start working with them there. I mean, it's not like, um, I don't know, it, that's the impression I get, but then again, that may be because I've been down there so many times in the offices, which y'all have great offices and you have uh, the Bitcoin commons which is great i mean and so many events going on there i recommend people get involved with unchained just to go to bitcoin commons and stuff go to those events but uh, we're going to go with some more stuff about unchained right after these words from our sponsor so please do stay tuned see you in a minute Today we're talking with Joe from Unchained, Unchained Capital. Joe, do y'all go by Unchained more now or still Unchained Capital? I never know. Every time I say that one way or another, I go, am I saying it right? Um, yeah, well, we do go by Unchained more or you know, since acquiring the domain and uh, some of our rebrand have tried to, to simplify. Um, it's funny. I mean, there's ways Unchained Capital gets confused with or used to get confused. The feedback would be that it sounds like a fund. I mean, we're not a fund. Um, we do financial services, but, uh, you know, then, but yeah, we've also not been able to really shake the, the capital, um, you know, too easily. And it's still our corporation, you know, Unchain Capital Inc. So uh, either really works. Sometimes saying Unchain Capital, you know, also clarifies we're not the uh, Unchained Crypto Podcast or something. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, I'll start putting that in my memory bank to just say Unchained. I don't know why. I keep I keep going back to it, I guess, because you're always Unchained Capital so long. I guess that's how you can tell someone who's been doing business with you a while versus someone who's new. Because the old people yeah. still have that in their memory, and the new people never had it in their memory. Uh, yeah. I, have a, I have another question for you that I think is a good question for boomers um, to know. If I had my Bitcoin with you, and I have my two wallets, and I, I'm, I'm just a dumbass, you know, I have this stuff hidden so that no one breaks in my house and finds it, but my kids don't know where it's at either, you know, in, the, in that scenario, and I die, 
and my wife and kids, nobody knows where this stuff's at. And so we definitely are not going to have two keys because no one knows where I've hidden it. I've done such a great job, supposedly. What, with this being at a two or three and being with you, is there a way to be helped by y'all with that or, or not? If, you, if, if your two keys are, are unrecoverable, then unfortunately there's not the, the Bitcoin is equivalent to loss. Okay, uh, so it's just like if you had one key, a wallet, regular wallet. Yeah, that, that's why you know it is advisable, and everyone's situation can be different. But to, you maybe have one of those keys in in more of a known location to the people close to you, uh, so they they can get access to it, um, and then you can keep the other key you know, to yourself uh, as much as you like or not share. Um, and then yeah, in the in the unfortunate event if you're incapacitated or or deceased, um, Unchained is there to help, and, and I think that's one of the interesting roles we play because. Uh, I think maybe you, and I'm certainly you, and maybe your listeners are familiar with you know, the concept of self custody here, like what we're talking about with these vaults is calling and holding their own keys. And uh, many people can and still do self custody using just one hardware wallet or um, you know, some setup that uh, just is exclusive to them or they have exclusive knowledge or control over and don't share any keys with anybody else. Uh, but we, we get to provide this, this kind of service that really helps out. When, um, I mean, things kind of touch the legal system or things have to touch like things that require government reporting or record keeping. So um, we don't uh, we don't impinge on people's uh, ability to like unilaterally control the asset, have that, that advantage of, of security and censorship you know, resistance. And, you, know, you know, you'll always be able to move your Bitcoin you know, uh, as long as you have those two keys or your possession. Then that, that's a great feature. But when it comes to like something like an IRA account. Or um, in the systems we're talking about, like of, of inheritance and uh, dealing with you know issues after after death, and those are situations where sometimes you need uh, you're dealing with like the, the assets title, or you're need, dealing with some kind of reporting or record keeping that needs to go to uh, the government, um, or you know, a, a kind of more an institution that you can kind of trust when you're not there. You can trust that the people at that institution or that institution itself will come through on, you know, evaluating, for instance, the validity of a, a request to move a person's Bitcoin by some next of kin. Um, so we're, you know, we're going to put that stuff through a process where we're, we're sure that it's a lawful request that is valid within the either the, the state you know, will or, or any kind of probate process. So um, that's something that, yeah, I think you can put part of what the value proposition is for an Unchained is being able to sleep easy, knowing that, oh, okay, I've got this set up where you know, I got self custody. It's my Bitcoin. It's my control. Check, and if something were to happen to me. You know, I've told my my spouse, my partner, uh, or or a kid or or family member, you know, how to get to one of the keys and and work with Unchained to uh, access the Bitcoin. So, if they had one key instead of both keys, they're going to have to know how to get in touch with you, and would they have to prove I'm dead? Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, depending, and we'll have some more features that make this like baked into the, the account structure over time, but you can think about it like, um, like in, in our IRA accounts, for instance, you already have like a beneficiary um, uh, a designation, J just like with a Schwab or typical brokerage account, you designate these beneficiaries uh, in it. And so you can kind of do that in our case. And um, I'm not, uh, I don't have hundred percent of the details, but essentially, yeah, the, the next of kin or that beneficiary can come if they prove that the person's dead or deceased and uh, everything else checks out about who they are and their match to this, this beneficiary or, the, or their rights to be able to um, provide instructions as to what should happen with those assets, um, then we'll comply. And so, yeah, it kind of brings that a little bit, a little bit of that convenience that is there in these scenarios of, of like a Schwab, you know, IRA account that, that is left to some next of kin. Um, Schwab is going to be the, the party that has to administer that. Um, we don't control the coin. We can't move it ourselves. We can't supply a signature. And sometimes that's enough. Okay. And then something that you've also mentioned, you, you went in to mention like traditional finance. I want to make sure people know Unchained does offer Bitcoin IRAs, which yep. I have some myself. And uh, to me, now, I know those are available in Roth. Are they just regular too or only in Roths? Uh, great question. I think Roth. Yeah, that's what I thought, but I thought I could be wrong, so I kind of was looking for clarification on that. But to me, you know, at my age, to buy a Roth IRA, you know, how much I can appreciate, you know, before I die. You know, when you're 20, it makes a lot more sense. But with Bitcoin, it makes a lot of sense. You know, if you're just buying Exxon, you know, have an Exxon in there in your Roth, it's not going to make much sense. But with Bitcoin, I mean, it can make a lot of sense, you know, to have it in a Roth. 
And I think that's the best example for a Roth for someone who's over 70. Yeah, for an asset that could see yeah, another 10x appreciation in the next five to 10 years, yeah, it's still a great way to bundle in some, some tax savings at the same time you're acquiring Bitcoin. Now, we only got three minutes left, so I'm going to go to this now, and then we may talk some more. It's according to how long this takes. But where can people follow you? Uh, let's get that out of the way and follow and find out about Unchained and stuff like that. Well, I mean, Unchained.com is our uh, website for, for the company, and we're on Twitter or X, uh, you know, X formerly known as Twitter, uh, at, at Unchained.com. And myself personally, I'm also on, on X uh, at Joseph Kelly. Feel free to find me there, at me, or email me at joe at unchained.com. And yeah, we'd love to serve you, love, love to help. If there's anything we can do, um, feel free to reach out. And then this is something I saw that I want to know about then is you're a pilot. Is that right? Yeah. Because I saw yeah. a plane on your site. Yeah, heck yeah. So yeah, I've been a pilot for... Ten years. Another thing I I, uh, I took up after um, we sold sold that first business in 2013. I started taking flying lessons, and I actually got a small plane. My my father lived in northern Mexico for about ten years, uh, and so I was I was taking the plane down there to see him. It's actually a much more convenient way to to get to him because he's in a kind of a remote spot versus uh, commercial flights down there. Yeah, yeah, that would be a much better way to go see him if it's close. We. Actually, my wife and I went up to Arkansas to go fly fishing in a small plane that a friend of ours had. First time I'd ever been in a small plane. And while it was a new experience, it was way cool. Much better than going through the routine of going through TSA and doing all that stuff and getting on a plane. And actually, even though the plane moves slower than a commercial jet, it's really not a lot longer. By the time you say, I got to get there an hour, two hours early, I got to get my luggage, and blah, blah, blah. So we really enjoyed the plane. And now uh, we're, we're going to start the, uh, he gave us, he told us we could like find airport, the airport, and that people would take us places if we paid for the fuel because they got to get that flying time in and fuel is expensive. And so if they're not doing anything, they might give us a flight, you know, for fuel and we can rent a car there and do what we got to do and come back. So I think next time I go to Austin, I'm going to check that out because that's a nightmare getting to where you're at, dude. I don't know how you live down there in Austin with the traffic. They did not plan that traffic out properly, but I know you had nothing to do with that. But Joe, I do appreciate you coming on the show. I'm sorry I go from subject to subject uh, kind of in a weird order, but I get to where I'm going. And is there nothing else you want to say before we get out of here? No, it's great, Gary. Great to spend time with you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I look forward to seeing you at BitBlock Boom, and I'm sure I'll see you before then somewhere, if not in Austin, somewhere else. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. That's good. See you. And everybody else will be right back after this word from our sponsor. And welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. I hope you've enjoyed today's show and you found out a lot about Unchained. Now, like I said on the show several times, I'm a big believer in Unchained and a customer of Unchained. So it was easy to want to bring them on the show and talk about their product. And, and Joe's not the first person we've had on from Unchained. Um, so uh, I hope you check out Unchained. Like I said, I think they're a great company. Stephanie, what'd you think of today's show? My great producer, Stephanie. Uh, the show is always great, and I'm always very fascinated whenever we see and hear from somebody who's been in Bitcoin from closer to the beginning. Um, compared, and it's always good to hear about people coming in now too, but like even more so when they were in on it early. So hearing his story was really cool, and seeing how um, still stable and ongoing Unchain has been, even though it started a while ago, but it's still going strong. That's really cool to see. You know, I agree with you. It is always interesting to talk to people that have been into Bitcoin. Well, in Joe's case, since 2013. We've had some people who've been there from almost the beginning on the show, and they have a different perspective on Bitcoin than I think people who are getting into it, especially people who are getting into it at the moment. Um, because they've seen the ups and downs. They've seen the giant drops, you know, and the giant jumps. But uh, it was great having Joe on the show. And as I say, this show is just to educate you. I have no Bitcoin to sell you. 
I'm not going to sell you any, so please, you can feel comfortable recommending our show to your friends. I do want to tell you about a couple of things before we go, though. I want to make sure you know about BitBlock Boom. That's the Bitcoin conference I do in Dallas, Texas. We're celebrating our eighth year, so please check out BitBlockBoom.com. Our next event is in April, April 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th of next year. Of course, next year. can't be last year. So please check out BitBlockBoom.com. I also want to make sure you know about our meetup group. That's Meetup.com slash bitblockboom. We meet in Dallas. Um, usually we try to meet once a month, meetup.com slash bitblockboom. And a bunch of people, 30, 40 people normally show up and we talk about Bitcoin, eat barbecue, have a drink, whatever. So do check out meetup.com slash bitblockboom. Um, now I've also written a book. If you're not familiar with my book, Bitcoin, in the American Dream. It's a great book. Um, seven of us met for a week, stayed in an Airbnb for a week in Austin, Texas, and wrote this book in a week. It's a great book, 30-minute read. It's a great book to buy if you want to share Bitcoin with someone because you can read it on a flight. Hey, I do appreciate you watching today's show, and please join us next week for the next Bitcoin Boomer Show. And remember to stack those sats. See you later.